Richardson. We've got some uh, news tonight in the Idaho, uh, University of Idaho student murder case. And um, the accused killer here is really accused of, of the unthinkable, right? Take a step back, think about what, what, is, uh, what is alleged here. That this was someone who killed for the thrill of the kill. Someone killed because he wanted to kill someone. Right? And these types of um, killers, I think, strike a huge level of fear in the community because we look at a case like this and allegations like this and we say, wow, there was, there was no way to prevent this. There was no way to prevent this. There was no warning signs. You know, a lot of the cases that we look at here on Court TV, spousal murder, you know, there's something going on, there's warning signs. If you ever find me dead, you know, look at this person. And, and we look at those and we're like, okay, those are isolated. Those are p situations that other people had. And maybe there were some signs, maybe they could be, um, you, you can pick up on these things and you can do something to protect yourself if you're ever in a similar situation. But here, here, someone who is going to just find a target or targets and go after him just because he wants to kill someone and has no connection to those people. So there's no signs, there's no warning, there's no reason. I mean, that strikes absolute fear inside the community. And that's what happened in this case. And I mean, you look at the, the victims here, they did nothing wrong. They did absolutely nothing wrong. Not that we ever blame victims here on Court TV, but sometimes people engage in behavior or get mixed up with the wrong crowd or whatever, and then something happens. Obviously, they don't deserve it, but you can kind of see how someone got into that situation, like a, a choice here, a choice there. But here, come on, they, they did nothing wrong. They're, they're living their best lives, working hard at school, getting ready, for the world, getting ready for the world to make their marks. It's all taken away. So for the families, right, you, you have this incredible loss. So from the beginning, we've seen them, and, and it becomes for them a, a search for justice, right? This is, this is all they have left. This is, this is one thing that they don't want taken from them, is the opportunity for justice in the case, is that there are questions to be answered, who did it? How did they do it? How did it happen? And is that person going to be held responsible? And the search for justice is an excruciating process. And, and it starts with incredible loss and grieving and you, you don't know. You just, you know, you don't know where to go, where to look, what to say, what to do, how to react, what to expect, all of that. And as the process churns, you know, there are certain milestones. And now we're getting ready for the trial. The trials are tough. Trials are tough. They're, they are unpredictable. Absolutely unpredictable. And that's going to happen here, too. No one knows what the results of this are going to be. Um, and that's why investigators are always searching for the evidence. And that's what they did from the beginning here. And let me tell you, I, I've been... In, incredibly impressed by the investigation in this case. Now, we're learning as much as is permitted out in Idaho. They're holding back a lot of stuff, right? We're not seeing and hearing everything, but we've come across search warrants and some things that have been released. And tonight we have some more stuff for you. So you have a, a better idea of, of what they have. And we're going to go through some of that evidence. Um, but I want to go back to the, the search, the search, the search of his um, apartment out in Washington, just over the state line from, from Idaho. Um, they executed this, uh, this search warrant on December 30th, 2022, December 30th of last year. And again, they're not showing us everything, right? The, the body cams shut off at a certain point where that footage has not been released. This is all stuff that we're going to see and hear during the trial. But let's take a look first at the police at the moment when they're executing this search warrant because this is important. You, you want to get that justice for the families and for the community. And you want someone held responsible. 
And we know in our system of justice, you need the evidence because you've got to prove it beyond any and all reasonable doubt. That's why these search warrants and searches are so significant. Let's watch. Police department search warrant, come to the door. Police department, search warrant, come to the door. One more. Police department, search warrant, come to the door. Open the door and do an announcement. Police department, show yourself. We have a search warrant for the building. Police department, show yourself. That's where it cuts off, right? We'll see and hear more during the trial. But this is the search of the apartment. Now, during the course of the search, things develop uh, in this case. And a search warrant is very specific, right? It, it, you know, a, a judge will sign off on it, uh, but it's, it's, it's as limited as in scope as possible because this is the United States of America. You need a warrant to make certain searches and you wanna make sure you, you dot the I's and cross the T's because if you find something, you wanna make sure the judge who's here in the case and making the decisions on what evidence is admissible, what's inadmissible, you wanna make sure you're not violating anyone's rights and you're doing everything according to the law. So during the course of all of this, they came across some, some storage units that they wanted to get into. Now. Again, they want to dot the I's across the T. So that's not necessarily part of the initial search warrant. So they've got to get a judge on the line. And here you have uh, the assistant chief uh, from the Washington State University police making the call, trying to get the search warrant to get into those storage units. And during this call, we hear a little bit more insight into the investigation. Let's take a listen. On 123022, while serving a search warrant, number SW1229-2022A for Steptoe Apartment G201, we found a padlock, round in shape, in the living room closet. Based on my training experience, I recognize the padlock to be the shape of locks typically used on storage units. The lock is round in shape, and the design limits the ability for somebody to cut the lock off. A key matching the lock was also found in the living room in the TV stand next to the keys, which appear to be for the Wilson Short office, which we also have a search warrant for. I had Officer Kirshner contact the apartment coordinator who confirmed there are storage closets available to residents located in some of the buildings, or excuse me, they're located in the same buildings as the laundry areas. Sergeant Pelemny went to the area and confirmed there's a storage closet with the address G201 written in black marker on the word on the wood door. The storage closet is located in building F as in Frank of Steptoe Apartments. The storage door is not locked and the door is slightly ajar. I believe the storage unit or closet was likely used by Koberger to store the items and likely access between the time of the murders and his travel to Pennsylvania, where he was later arrested. It is also believed the storage closet could contain or contains certain trace evidence listed in number one and number five of evidence to be seized in the above named search warrant. Um, I can read those to you. Number one is blood or other bodily fluid or human tissue or skin cells or items with blood or other bodily or human tissue or skin cells on the items. Number five, trace evidence including DNA from blood or skin cells or other source footprints, fingerprints, hair, whether human or animal or dog. Uh, I asked the judge, do you find this there to be probable cause to believe the items, excuse me, do you find there's probable cause to believe these items may be found in the storage unit? And do you authorize the, the search of the unit? 
okay, thank you, officer. Okay, the court hereby finds there is probable cause to uh, search the uh, aforesaid described uh, storage unit for items as referenced in the search warrant. And uh, there is probable cause, and the court hereby authorizes you to sign my name, uh, Gary J. Leidy, on a search warrant uh, to enter the aforesaid described uh, storage facility. There's always a, a judge on call, and, and the judge on call, literally on the call, um, authorizing the search of that unit. So you kind of get an insight into what was happening here. He's getting arrested in Pennsylvania. They're going through his apartment. They're looking for evidence anywhere and everywhere. They see the lock. They put two and two together. Let's find out where this storage unit is. They locate it, then they go search it. Um, let's bring in our guest joining us tonight, former FBI special agent of 25 years, SWAT team tactical medic of 15 years, expert in organized crime and high-profile arrests. Uh, she's joining us in Jacksonville, Florida. Jennifer Coffendaffer is with us. Great to see you. Also joining us tonight from Los Angeles, senior reporter for DailyMail.com, uh, Caitlin Becker, who's been covering the story from the beginning. Uh, great to have you both here. Thank you so much. Uh, Jennifer, let me start with you. It's, it's like... You know, we watch Law and I always reference Law and Order, right? So Law and Order, you know, they go they go to the judge's house in the middle of the night. He's got the robe on and he signs the search warrant to go in. Here they're doing it by phone, uh, but you, you're so conscious, right? In a big case like this, in any case, that you need the evidence. You got to dot the I's, cross the T's, and if you discover something during your search, um, you got to follow up. You got to do everything the right way. Otherwise, you could lose the case. Absolutely. You have to get warrants, even if it would have been just a safe or a lockbox, anything outside that scope. And I dare say in a case like this, it, you just have to err on the side of, of complete reasonableness. And the fact that they got the warrant for that storage unit was completely in line with what they should have done. And Caitlin Becker, talking about the investigation here, um, when this story broke, there were a lot of skeptics out there, right? A lot of skeptics say, small town, they're in over their heads, they're never going to catch this guy, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, the more we learn, um, the more we find out they knew exactly what they were, what they were doing. Well, Vinny, I have said for months now that I think the Moscow PD has done a, just a master class on what a proper investigation really looks like. And this is coming from me, who was one of those skeptics, who for weeks and weeks and weeks was wondering what was going on. We had a trickle of information coming out from to the reporters. We couldn't understand why they didn't have a person of interest or a suspect. Meanwhile, it was like a duck on a pond. Everything was calm and collected. We didn't think anything was going on and the feet were going underneath. And then we find out seven weeks later that they make this explosive arrest at the same time that they're executing search warrants at his parents' house in Pennsylvania, at his office on the campus, at his home on the campus. It really has been done in a way that I think is trying to ensure a conviction without any loopholes. Let's get to some of the evidence now, some of the items that were seized from the apartment from this search. One nitrite-type black glove. One nitrite-type black glove. Jennifer, what are your thoughts about the black glove here? Well, there's certainly a different, so there's nitrile gloves and nitrite gloves, but they specifically wrote nitrite, which is a black, very close wearing glove to your hand. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, I think when you put it with all the other items, it becomes more interesting. Also have some receipts here, Caitlin Becker. We've got a Walmart receipt with one Dickies tag and two Marshalls receipts. Um, guess saving a couple bucks. Could be, but I think what they might be pointing to is the outfit, perhaps, that the witness the other roommate who was in the house said that she saw the killer wearing all black hood mask top to bottom we also have that latent shoe print that had a very specific sole pattern so i think perhaps we could be trying to connect those items with these receipts we don't know what was on those receipts of course and we haven't actually found to my knowledge the knife or the outfit that the killer was purported to be wearing at the time. So we could be seeing the, um, the strings sort of being put together here. 
Okay, uh, Jennifer, we've got a dust container from a Bissell Power Force vacuum. How probable is it that you could pick up some sort of evidence in a dust container from a vacuum? Very probable. If he used that to clean up and there were hairs or dog hairs or other dust um, that was significant in terms of the same type of item that was at 1122 King Road, they are going to go through that and sift through that very closely to see if they can make the connection to people, to dogs, and to 1122 King Road. So I'm very glad they took that. All right, our guests are staying with us, uh, Jennifer Koffendaffer and Caitlin Becker. Uh, we're going to go through more of this Evidence Plus coming up next hour. In Manchester, New Hampshire, five-year-old Harmony Montgomery disappeared in 2019. Police say she was murdered. And now the two adults who were living with Harmony, her dad, Adam, and her stepmom, Kayla, were in court today. Adam on trial and Kayla testifying against him. I was nervous and scared that he'd get in trouble. Why would he get in trouble for having a gun? Because he's a felon and not supposed to have one. On the next episode of Accomplice to Murder. Renee and Brett met when they were in high school. Most of the time they were at each other's throats. She was having an affair. They were celebrating their anniversary right before her boyfriend confronted them on the beach and shot him. She had to be a part of it. I just knew that he was going to kill me next. Did you kill Brent Poole? Absolutely not. Accomplice to Murder with Fanny Politan. All new episode, Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. On the morning of November 13th, a 911 call was made at 11.58 a.m. reporting an unconscious person. Moscow police responded and found two victims on the second floor and two victims on the third floor. The cause and manner of death was homicide by stabbing. Detectives arrested 28-year-old Brian Christopher Kohlberger in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania on a warrant for murder of Ethan Zena Madison and Kaylee. Koberger resides in Pullman, Washington and is a graduate student at Washington State University. These murders have shaken our community and no arrest will ever bring back these young students. But there is a search for justice to answer the questions and hold someone responsible for what happened. And, and trust me, if families don't get that, it is more than salt in the wound. It is more, it crushes them, absolutely crushes them. Whether it's an unsolved case or a case where they think they've solved it, they bring someone to trial and that person's found not guilty. So there's a lot of pressure on investigators and prosecutors to get the evidence and get it all right. We're taking a look at that evidence tonight with uh, Jennifer uh, Koffendaffer, former FBI special agent, and Caitlin Becker, a senior reporter for DailyMail.com. I want to take a look at some more of the evidence that was seized and some of it's similar. You got eight possible hair strands one fire TV stick with a cord and plug, one possible animal hair strand, one possible hair, one possible hair, one possible hair. Um, Jennifer, why do they say possible hair? Well, law enforcement knows not to take any guesses, even though if it seems as if it's an animal hair, they are going to just say possible, same with a strand of hair in case it ends up being a thread or, or something from a curtain or, or something else. Um, so it's very likely, but they always caveat with possible. Now, they also found a computer tower. Um, Caitlin Becker, uh, you look at this guy. I mean, do we know anything about his computer um, activities? This guy was a professor, right? So he's, there should be a lot of information on that computer. Well, he was a teaching assistant, not a professor, because he was in the process of trying to get his his PhD. And don't forget, Vinny, he got fired from that. Yeah, so right. it wasn't a very good one. But we know that the 
digital forensic evidence in this case, I think will be absolutely major. In addition to that computer tower and the Fire TV stick, there were warrants out for his Reddit account, his Google account, his Amazon account, basically all of his social medias, basically everything this guy did online and on a computer, the police and investigators are going to sift through. And those are really difficult to hide and erase. I think it's probably a lot easier to get rid of something physical versus something digital. And we know that the investigators are doing a deep dive into his digital footprint. So let, let's talk about evidence that they don't have. You, and you mentioned this, Caitlin, they, they don't have the murder weapon. They don't have the, the clothes, which we presume would be filled with blood. Uh, Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent, traced the accused killer's movements and the hours after the murders. Let's take a look. Just hours after police say four college students were brutally stabbed inside this home in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, the alleged killer returned to the scene. Brian Koberger's cell phone allegedly shows him here at 9:12 a.m. and staying for about 10 minutes. But that isn't the only location police placed Koberger that day in the hours after the murders. According to the probable cause affidavit, Brian Koberger's cell phone records show him moving south from Pullman, Washington, where he lived in an on-campus apartment at Washington State University, towards Lewiston, Idaho, about a 50-minute drive. The town of Lewiston is located on the border of Washington State, where just across the Snake River is the bordering town of Clarkston, Washington. It was here at approximately 12.36 p.m. November 13th, 2022, when cell phone records placed Koberger's vehicle here on Port Drive next to Kate's Cup of Joe coffee stand. The surveillance videos here at the U.S. Chef Store show his white Hyundai Elantra drive past. Then, just 10 minutes later, at 12.46 p.m., Koberger's cell phone records place him at the nearby Albertson's grocery store. Surveillance video at 12.49 p.m. shows Koberger walking through the store and purchasing unknown items at the checkout. He leaves at approximately 1.04 p.m. The probable cause affidavit does not indicate location data for the next few hours of the day. It isn't until around 5.30 p.m. that the affidavit indicates Koberger's cell phone located in Johnson, Idaho. But there is no Johnson, Idaho. The affidavit may have meant this community of Johnson, Washington, right on the border of Idaho State. It's a location consistent with the affidavit's route and it's surrounded by cell phone towers. For three minutes from 5.32 to 5.36 p.m. November 13, 2022, Koberger's cell phone pings here near the community of Johnson, but then his cell phone goes dark for three hours. The affidavit notes that this location in Johnson is consistent with the phone being in the same area that it traveled in the hours immediately following the murders. And according to the affidavit, from 5.36 p.m. when it was in Johnson until 8.30 p.m. November 13th, Koberger's phone stopped reporting to the network, meaning he turned it off, put it in airplane mode, or the phone was in an area without cell coverage. While the probable cause affidavit does provide new revelations into the movements of the alleged killer in the hours after the murders, there are still many questions that remain. Why did he drive so far to the grocery store? What did he buy there? Did he get rid of that murder weapon and other incriminating evidence along the way? Or during that three hour period, his phone went dark. For now, we wait and answers may only come during his trial. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, Chanley Painter, Court TV. Let's bring back in our guests. Uh, Jennifer, what are your thoughts about everything that's happening in these hours afterwards? Well, I think it's very possible uh, that he was actually getting rid of evidence, including the knife and what he wore during this time frame. We don't know, and we're not going to know until trial. But I think at, at trial, we are going to get such specificity as to his movements, the actions, and so forth, we're going to have a whole picture that's painted. 
You know what's really eerie to me, Caitlin, is that he returned to the scene. And he returned before police were even there. I wonder what's going through his mind as he shows up and is like, it's just another day. Like, no one is there. There's no police. There's no emergency vehicles. There's no crime team. Nothing. At that point, we're still hours before that 911 call would be made. So the fact that he was essentially tracked back to the scene of the crime before anyone knew a crime has been committed is very curious. And your two questions that you have there are the one you just said, you know, does he, and we, this is all, you know, alleged, he's alleged he has not been convicted, but does the alleged killer go back to see if there are cops there, if the ambulance has been called, if there's a big scene, or does the alleged killer go back to maybe see if there's a way to get back in? You have to remember the knife sheath was dropped in there. That is a massive piece of physical evidence that was left behind, a massive mistake. So I do wonder if there was maybe some regret in that way if he is in fact the killer. And another one little thing that I did want to point out as well, you know, Chanley detailed what he did that in the hours after that call was made, but in the hours before that, between the time of the murders and the time his car and phone was spotted again in the middle of the night, I was there just like Chanley, I drove that route as well. Um, you mentioned earlier the clothes that the killer was wearing likely being very bloodied. I do wonder if during that time that his car disappeared for hours down that dark road, if that was a time to change your clothes. So when you go home, if anyone sees you walking in the door, they don't see you covered with blood. Yeah, and I'm wondering what evidence they could get from the car itself, that there has to be some connection there. A ton. Um, Jennifer, is it, it's a cliche, right? The, the, the criminal always returns to the scene of the crime from your experience. How true is that cliche? Well, I think in this situation, he was watching on television. He was thinking that something was going to be made of everything that happened again if Brian Koberger is found responsible. And I think he truly wondered, oh my gosh, why aren't people there? Why hasn't this been uh, discovered? And so I think curiosity got to him. And I concur about the knife sheath. I think at least it crossed his mind as to whether he could get back in or maybe he didn't know where he dropped it and thought maybe he would get lucky and he dropped it outside. So uh, it's sort of cliche. In this case, it wasn't cliche, it would seem. When we come back, we're gonna talk more about this case and the impact of social media at trial, the social media of the victims and the accused. I started hearing these stories about murder and stuff. I'm about to be the biggest drug dealer that you can become. <laughs> oh my God, are they starting a war with you or what? I'm not gonna lie, it felt good to be a gangster. She just points the gun out of my face. Boom, 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 boom. Just shoots me. We knew that what we were doing had consequences, but we just didn't care. Vice on Court TV, weeknights at 7, 6 central, only on Court TV. It's tough to watch that. I mean, that's, that's what they should be doing, right? Having fun with friends, posting stuff on TikTok, goofing around. Uh, you know, you're finishing up your college career, getting ready for the world. Um, but it's all gone. It's all gone. Um, so in this case, there's going to be a lot of information from social media, from the victims, um, witnesses, and, and the defendant. And there's now an order to seal and redact uh, search warrants relative to a lot of this. Take a look, folks. Um, AT&T stuff, uh, Google, Reddit, Snapchat, uh, Strava, and TikTok. So you've got all that stuff is going to be sealed, which tells me it's part of the case. It's part of the evidence that's been collected by these incredible investigators. Uh, let's uh, bring back in our guests still with us, Jennifer Coffendaffer and Caitlin Becker. And joining us now also in Los Angeles, California, body language expert, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert, witness, and columnist, Dr. Carol Lieberman. Great to see you all. Caitlin, I want to start with you. How, 
How prolific was everyone on social media? What do we know from, from victims to witnesses to, to the uh, accused? The victims were extremely prolific on social media. This is the age that you are. They are social media babies. So they were all over all of the apps. I mean, up until moments before she was stabbed to death, Xana Carnotal was on TikTok. So we know that these these three girls, as well as Ethan, were all over social media. And Brian Koberger's social media presence, perhaps not as much as they were, but I think that Reddit is very telling because after the murders, there were a lot of online rumors that people were talking about the murders on Reddit and they could be perhaps Brian Koberger himself. So I'll be very curious to see if those that Reddit warrant is gonna come back for after the murders and if we will actually find out whether it was him on there talking about it. Dr. Carol Learman, I want you to take a, a look here. I've got a couple of uh, posts that were allegedly made by the accused here. It's from a New York Times report. Um, the accused commiserated with other users while suffering from a little understood neurological condition called visual snow in which a person's vision is obscured by scattering dots, much like the static scene on an analog television. Here are some of his alleged posts. I feel like an organic sack of meat with no self-worth. As I hug my family, I look into their faces, I see nothing. It is like I'm looking at a video game, but less. Nothing I do is enjoyable. I am blank. I have no opinion. I have no emotion. I have nothing. Can you relate? What are you hearing there, Dr. Lieberman? Well, those posts were, um, and one similar to that, were when he was relatively young. Um, and I think what the defense is going to do or could do is to use those to try to show that uh, he had these problems, you know, even though there is, you can't, the, I, uh, Idaho doesn't have not guilty by reason of insanity, but you can still bring in some um, psychological aspects to the person. And I think that's going to show, you know, that, uh, that he had all these problems that were never really treated, uh, at least to our knowledge so far. Um, and so... So, you know, it's, it brings sympathy for him, if nothing else. What about this choice of words? Organic sack of meat. That, to me, that is just bizarre. Yes. And, you know, even when he says, um, what did he say? That it was all blank, that he doesn't feel anything. I mean, that actually could be used um, by the prosecutor to show a soci sociopathy that he has no empathy for people, that, you know, even his family, he talks about that he doesn't see anything in his family's eyes when he goes to hug them or looks at them. So it, a lot of his things could be used both ways. Jennifer, I want to read for you um, a Reddit post by a student investigator identified as the accused. It was deleted from Reddit after the arrest. Um, research participation needed. Hello, my name is... Uh, and I am inviting you to participate in a research project that seeks to understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision making when committing a crime. In particular, this study seeks to understand the story behind your most recent criminal offense with an emphasis on your thoughts and feelings throughout your experience. In the event that your most recent offense was not one that led to a conviction, you may still participate. Additional surveys are included after the open-ended section as to best understand and your unique traits. The study should take about 15 to 20 minutes to fully complete. What do you make of this guy? Well, certainly much has been made out of this uh, post, and I think it should be from the standpoint of what he chose to inquire about. And I think he was really trying to relate uh, to the criminal mind, uh, perhaps struggling with his uh, criminal mind, again, if he's convicted of this crime. So it makes a lot of sense. I think it's very telling uh, that he would choose this particular project uh, as he was perhaps in the infancy of thinking about uh, committing these crimes. Dr. Kyle Learman, do you think there's anything to the possibility of someone trying to get some firsthand data, right, in a, re in a sick, really sick research project by actually committing the crime? Yes, absolutely. Um, 
you know, I think all along from his study in psychology in college and then getting into criminal crimin criminology uh, as a graduate student and so on, I think he was trying to understand himself. And, um, and so, yes, I think that that really, you know, he was, he was trying to understand what, what is it going to feel like when I do this is what I really think that it is. But, you know, I think that one of the most telling things, and perhaps you have that that you were going to put up, is um, the post that he did, or it seems like he did, uh, where he called himself Papa Rogers, because that is a big clue, uh, in my opinion, that he's really relating to Elliot Rogers, who is the number one uh, incel, like the Papa incel, the most respected, the one who uh, created that uh, attack on college students in Santa Barbara. So, you know, that was his pseudonym. Uh, again, I, I think it will turn out that that was his pseudonym. Certainly it was, you know, I, I don't know how he thought that nobody was going to figure that out, but um, we'll see. We shall see. I want to thank everyone tonight. Great, great panel. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, Jennifer Koffendaffer, and of course, Caitlin Becker, senior reporter, dailymail.com. Thank you all so much. And hopefully you'll be back really, really soon.